Hi, my name is Meeta Kumar and the module we'll discuss today is about what an economy means, the types of economies and the economic problems faced by them and how to solve these problems. In particular, we will talk about uh, central problems of an economy. We will also talk about production possibility frontiers, the organization of economic activities in different kinds of economies, such as a centrally planned economy, the market economy, or a mixed economy. We will talk about positive and normative economics, and very briefly about microeconomics and macroeconomics. So, how do we define an economy? An economy constitutes of all the activities in relation to production, consumption, and distribution of goods and services. Let us first understand what we mean by goods and services. Goods are tangible objects which are used to satisfy human wants. And services are intangible objects which are used to satisfy human wants as well. Things like wheat, apples, chocolates, phones, cars are all goods. Education, health, banking, transport, ETC, these are services. The central problem of an economy is that human wants are unlimited. A good way to start to think about this is to list everything that you want. How long is that list? With the resources that one has, all the wants of an individual cannot be fulfilled at any given point of time. Therefore, human beings need to choose which wants to satisfy and how best to use the available resources to satisfy those wants. One has to make informed choices about what to consume and what not to consume. For example, if you have 100 rupees as pocket money every month and you love to consume ice creams, chocolates, biscuits, how should you spend the rupees 100 such that you get the most out of your money? The problem at the level of the economy is similar. Any nation has a limited amount of resources, land, labor, forest, minerals, water, machines and factories, all these are limited. A nation therefore needs to decide on how to allocate these resources towards the production of different goods and services so that its citizens are best off. Of course, things are much more complicated at the level of the nation. It is much more difficult to decide what makes a nation better off or best off and much easier to decide what makes you best off. Basic problems arise because human wants are unlimited and resources are limited. Thus, Lionel Robbins, the famous British economist in the early 20th century, defined economics as a science that studies human behavior as a relationship between unlimited wants and limited resources, which have alternative uses. The limits on resources and their alternative uses gives rise to the problem of what to produce and in what quantities to produce. What if resources were unlimited? Obviously, then the problem of what to produce or in what quantities to produce would not arise. Why? Because then the economy would be able to produce everything that everyone wants or needs in whatever quantities they wanted. But since the resources are limited, the economy has to decide to produce certain commodities in limited quantities. So, consider a farmer who has a plot of land. He decides to grow wheat on this plot of land. Then, he cannot use the same plot of land to grow potatoes or tomatoes, can he? Nor can he build his house in, on the same plot of land. So, since resources are scarce, the farmer has to choose how best to use his land. If all its resources are being used, a nation that wants to increase the production of one commodity can do so only by decreasing the production of some other commodity. This is known as the problem of allocation of resources. Another question which an, any economy faces is, 
how to produce. So should a farmer plow the land using a pair of bullocks or should he use a tractor? Should he use chemical fertilizers bought from the market or should he use manure from the cattle he owns? This is the question which is concerned with the techniques to be used. At any given point of time, the technology that's available to a nation is fixed. Typically, we think of technology as a set of techniques. A technique, very simply put, is the ratio in which inputs are combined to get an output. For example, cloth may be woven by a power loom or by a hand loom. Similarly, water to irrigate a field can be drawn from a well by a pair of bullocks or by a motor. In the case of production using hand looms and bullocks, we are using what we call labor intensive techniques. This technique uses more labor per unit capital relative to other techniques. In the case of production using power looms and motors, we are using a capital intensive technique. The choice between different methods to be used for production depends on the availability of these inputs and their prices. Generally, prices are lower for those inputs which are available in abundance. Therefore, developing countries which have large populations are relatively more inclined to using labor intensive techniques of production. Another question that arises is, for whom are the goods to be produced? Every society produces goods so that people can eat, wear, use, or otherwise consume them. Who gets what share of the economy's output? In the modern world, goods are produced for those who can pay for them or who have the purchasing power for these commodities. Think of your country as one giant mall. How much of the goods that are available can you consume? Notice that you can only consume what you can buy. The more your income in general, the more you can buy and the greater your, your share of the country's output. So the economy faces three basic questions. One, what to produce. Two, how to produce. And three, for whom to produce. Now, each of these is a complex problem. A standard technique that economists use to deal with complex problems is to break it up into simpler representative problems and then see how they may be solved. A solution to these simpler problems can then be generalized through throw light on the real and so very complicated world. One technique we use to analyze the what to produce problem is to imagine a world in which only two goods are being produced. The advantage of doing this is that we can then represent this problem on a two dimensional diagram using a graph that we call a production possibility frontier. A production possibility frontier is the curve representing the maximum of two different goods which an economy can produce given, and this is important, given the technology and the resources it has. Imagine an economy that produces only wheat and cotton. The given resources are land and labor. And with these given resources, this country can produce either 22 bales of cotton and no wheat, which is point A on figure one, or five tons of wheat and no cotton, which is point C on the same figure, or a combination of both wheat and cotton that lie on the blue curve, such as point B. Point B represents 10 bales of cotton and four tons of wheat. To increase the production of wheat, some land and labor would have to be moved away from the production of cotton towards the production of wheat and vice versa. Thus, any point on the PPF is the maximum that an economy can produce given technology and given the amounts of land and labor that it has. Since the economy can do no better than the PPF, 
all combinations of wheat and cotton that lie on the PPF or the production possibility frontier are considered efficient. A combination like G, which contains 15 units of cotton and 4 tons of wheat, is not achievable for the economy because this economy just does not have enough land and labor for this combination. On the other hand, a point like H, which contains 15 bales of cotton and 2 tons of wheat, is achievable but leaves some resources unused. It is possible with the existing land and labor and technology to increase the production uh, of either wheat or cotton or both from H. Such a combination is therefore considered inefficient. This production possibility curve is also known as a transformation curve as it describes how one good transforms into another by moving resources from the production of one to the other. Ideally, an economy can solve the problem of what to produce by choosing the point on its PPF that makes its citizens best off. If we lay down in tabular form the possible combinations of goods which can be produced at different points on PPF, we construct a production possibility schedule. The production possibility schedule corresponding to the production possibility curve we've just discussed is here. If this economy chooses to produce 16 bales of cotton, what is the maximum amount of wheat that it can produce? You can see from table 1 that this will be 3 tons at point D. Suppose this same economy chooses to produce 2 tons of wheat. Can it produce 20 bales of cotton? Table 1 tells you it cannot. The maximum cotton it can produce if it produces 2 tons of wheat is 19 bales at point C. Let us now look at the shape of the PPF. The PPF is downward sloping and it's bowed out. Notice that the PPF is downward sloping because each point on the PPF represents the maximum output that is possible from the resources that the economy has. So, if the economy chooses to have more wheat, it will have to give up some cotton and vice versa. In other words, the maximum quantity of wheat and the maximum quantity of cotton that this economy can produce are inversely related. As one goes up, the other has to go down, hence the negative slope. Economists define opportunity cost as what must be sacrificed in order to get something. This helps us explain why the PPF is bowed out. Let us examine the PPF on which table 1 is based again. In order to get the first unit of wheat, the economy sacrifices one unit of cotton. We say that the opportunity cost of the first unit of wheat is one unit of cotton. Two units of cotton have to be given up for the second unit of wheat. So the opportunity cost of the second unit of wheat is two units of cotton. Notice that to get the fifth unit of wheat, ten units of cotton have to be given up. So the opportunity cost of wheat in terms of cotton is increasing. This gives the PPF its bowed out shape. Why does the opportunity cost rise? When the economy chooses to get the first unit of wheat, obviously land and labor have to be shifted from the production of cotton to the production of wheat. The first lot of factors shifted from cotton to wheat is likely to be those least suited to the production of cotton. So the sacrifice in terms of cotton is only small, it's one unit. As more and more factors are shifted out, these are likely to be those much more suited to cotton. The sacrifice in terms of cotton grows larger. The opportunity cost of wheat rises. 
in general, therefore, increasing opportunity costs arise because some factors may be better suited to the production of one commodity than the other. The shape of the PPF represents the phenomenon of increasing opportunity cost. We now move on to talk about shifts in the PPF. An outward shift in the PPF shows growth in an economy. It shows that the economy is able to produce more. The PPF may shift in two situations. One, the expansion of resources, and two, in case of an increase in the productive capacity of the existing resources. When the expansion of resources takes place, there is an increase in the resources. For example, more people have joined the labor market or more land becomes available for cultivation and the PPF shifts outward. Increases in productive capacity of existing resources, the productive capacity of existing resources may expand due to improvements in technology, education, training of the human resources, etc. In this case also, the PPF may shift outwards. How would the PPF move if technology of production of one commodity improves and that of the other remains the same? Suppose that the technology to produce cotton has improved. The maximum amount of cotton that the economy can produce with the amount of land and labor that it had has now increased. If the economy chooses to produce only cotton, it now produces not 22 as it was before, but 28 bales of cotton. But the technology to produce wheat has not changed. So if the economy chooses to produce only wheat, it will still produce five units of wheat as before. The PPF therefore shifts out along the y-axis as shown in the figure alongside. Similarly, when the advance in technology leads to an increase in the productivity of wheat, the PPF swings along the x-axis. This is shown in the figure alongside. In this case, improvements in technology allow us to produce more wheat from the same resources and the maximum amount of wheat we can now produce, if we produce no cotton at all, is six tons. However, the technology to produce cotton has not changed. If we choose to produce only cotton, we will produce 22 bales as before. In this case, the PPF swings along the x-axis. So we will use a small exercise to figure out if we've understood all the concepts we've discussed so far. So state whether this is the following are true or false. In an economy, resources and needs are unlimited. True? Answer, not true, false. B, there cannot be a parallel shift in the production possibility frontier. True? Not true, false. The point beyond a PPF represents unattainable levels of output. True? or false? True. Let us now talk about the organization of economic activities. There are different forms of economy where the question of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce are dealt differently. Let's take a look at these economies. The first of these, and the most usual, is the market or the capitalist economy. A capitalist economy is an economy where the means of production are owned by individuals who take their own decisions independently. This economy is also known as a market economy. In this economy, producers are free to produce what they want in any number of goods they want for any consumer and with whatever techniques they choose to use. So they solve the problem of what to produce by seeing which goods would fetch them the maximum amount of profit. They decide on the technology by selecting techniques that involve the least costs. 
They will solve the problem of for whom to produce by producing for the people who are able and willing to pay the highest prices. Economies such as those of US, France, Germany are commonly considered market economies. The second kind of an economy is a centrally planned or a socialist economy. In the case of socialist economies, the means of production are owned by the government or by a central authority that plans the different economic activities. This economy's main aim is to provide maximum welfare to its citizens. Therefore, the decisions about what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce are taken by the government. It is assumed that the government acts to ensure the best interests of the citizens. The erstwhile Soviet Union was a socialist economy, a mixed economy. In these economies, the means of production are only partly owned privately. The government owns a significant share of them as well. This means some decisions are taken by the government and some decisions are left for the market. India is considered a mixed economy. A very large part of the Indian economy is market-based. The agricultural sector is almost exclusively privately owned and operated. A very large part of the manufacturing sector is also privately owned and operated. However, the government owns some key industries. Until 1991, the government owned industries were the largest manufacturers of steel, aluminum, etc. in the country. The government also held a monopoly over some key services, banking, railways, telephones, power generation, etc. Although the role of the private sector in all these activities has grown since 1991, the government still remains a major economic power in India. This coexistence of private and government-owned enterprises is a key feature of a mixed economy. We have emphasized so far that economics is about making choices. What to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce. But what is the right choice? Economists like to make the difference between what is and what should be. We do this by differentiating between positive economics and normative economics. Positive economics is the branch of economics that deals with what actually is. It is based on facts and figures and is objective. An example of a positive statement is, consumers buy more wheat if the price of wheat falls. This statement can be verified by observing consumer behavior. It is based on facts. Normative economics, on the other hand, is that branch of economics that deals with what should be. It is based on value judgments and is subjective. An example of a normative statement is, the price of wheat ought not to increase because if it does, what will the poor eat? Economists like to deal mainly with positive statements. Positive statements, in fact, can go a long way to help us take or give up a normative stand. Let us re-examine the question of wheat prices. We can draw up a list of positive questions that help us decide whether or not the price of wheat should go up. One, are any of the poor wheat sellers? In other words, are small farmers producing and selling wheat? In that case, they may actually benefit if the price of wheat goes up. They will get higher revenues from selling whatever they produce. And in that case, we may actually favor an increase in wheat prices. Two, do the poor eat wheat mainly? Or do they eat something else? For example, rice or bajra or jowar or ragi? In this case, the price of wheat may not matter so much to the poor 
as much as the price of rice, bajra, jowar, or ragi would. And in this case, we may be less concerned with wheat prices than those of these other products, rice, bajra, jowar, and ragi. The study of economics is also divided into two broad fields, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics deals with the study of individual units as consumers and producers. Microeconomics looks at how consumers make their decisions to consume and how producers make their decisions to produce. It also examines how the decisions of individual agents are coordinated by the market. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, deals with aggregate measures of the economy. That is, it looks at the economic behavior of the whole economy. Macroeconomics looks at economy-wide phenomena such as national income and its determinants, growth, unemployment, inflation, etc. So, time for a small exercise. Which of the following is correct? Microeconomics is concerned with the problems of what, how, and for whom to produce. Macroeconomics is concerned with the individual decision-making units. Answer? Actually, none. To summarize what we've discussed in this module, every economy faces the problem of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. The production possibility frontier is a simple graphical representation of the choices facing an economy. Given the limited resources of the nation, an economy operating on its production possibility frontier is using its resources efficiently. The shape of the PPF represents the phenomenon of increasing opportunity cost and growth of the economy can be represented through shifts in the production possibility frontier. Different types of economies solve the problems of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce differently, depending on who owns the means of production. Broadly, the study of economics is divided into two fields, microeconomics and macroeconomics. We shall discuss all these concepts in more detail in the modules that follow. Thank you.